Chapter 5, Public Relations Bobby knew that a freak like Grant had to have more than a little dirt in his closet. The question was, what did he have and how much was there? He decided to do a little intelligence gathering on his own. On his next trip to the Black Cat, he asked his new friends to find out what they could about the prissy American. In every modern city, there is an army of service workers that see and hear everything. The best part is that no one notices them. The bartenders, waiters, maids, cooks, drivers, and maintenance people all have eyes and ears. There is so much that they see and hear that no one even thinks about them. Mr. Grant was as guilty as anyone. His secret trysts had not gone unnoticed. Word came back by the club that there was some information that he wanted. Later that day, Bobby dropped by for a cold beer, as was his custom after work. The American you asked about has some interesting sexual habits, Mr. Lopez told him. He checks into the Hotel Parisienne under a fake name with local prostitutes. I am told that he likes to do drugs and stay up all night having sex. Would you like me to find out who he sees regularly? I'm not sure I need that right now, but I would like to know the next time he checks in and what room he is in, if that is possible, Bobby asked. He never checks in on a weekday. Staying up all night would be hard to hide the next day, Mr. Lopez told him knowingly. Yeah, that would definitely blow his cover if he came in all jacked up and delirious from an all-nighter, wouldn't it? Bobby laughed. I think I need to drop in for a visit the next time he stays at the hotel. It will be a pleasure, my friend, Joe smiled. That Saturday night, Bobby got a call about his new friend, Mr. Grant. The poof is checked in under the name Mr. Smith. He is in room 268. I will need someone from room service, Bobby said. Ask the bartender, the voice on the phone said. Then the line went dead. Bobby finished what he was doing, since there was no need to hurry. He showed up at the Parisian Hotel a little after 10 o'clock. He stopped at the bar for a drink and a chat with the bartender, leaving a nice tip. It never hurts to have a good relationship with people who do your food and drink. He asked the bartender to point out his new friend from room service when he passed by. The $10 tip Bobby left ensured that any reasonable request, and some possibly illegal requests, would be fulfilled ASAP. It took 20 minutes for the man to pass by. The bartender beckoned him over. Bobby introduced himself, and the tall, thin man knew who he was. Bobby was more famous than he realized. I'm Robert O'Shaughnessy. My friend Mr. Lopez suggested we talk, that you could possibly do me a favor. Yes, sir. I'm Neme. I was told that you would be visiting, he said, grinning. I have an old friend, a Mr. Smith, in room 268. I would like to surprise him with some champagne, if that is possible. As Bobby passed him a $20 bill, he looked at it like it was a rare artifact that might disappear any moment. Yes, sir, I can arrange that for you. Excellent. Please take a bottle of good, but not your best champagne, up to his room and tell him it is compliments of the management. Try to get him to come out of the room to sign the bill. If he refuses, ask him if you can slide the check under the door and leave. I will surprise him when he comes out. Can you do that for me? The money ensured that his instructions would be followed to the letter. It took another 30 minutes to have everything ready. As Neme wheeled the room service cart into the elevator, Bobby slid in behind him so quietly that he was startled. It's just me, Bobby smiled. Let's go surprise my friend. Room 268 was a nice room, but nothing special. Knocking at the door, there was some movement and rustling before a long silence. Someone was listening at the door. Room service, Neme said as he knocked on the door again. What is it? came a voice from the other side. Sir, I have some complimentary champagne. It's from the management. Leave it there, please. I will get it later. Yes, sir. Could you please sign for it so they'll know I delivered the champagne? Neme asked. I'm not dressed. Please slide it under the door. Okay, here you go, sir. After a few minutes, the bill came back from under the door. With a strange look and a shrug of his shoulders, Neme walked away wondering what kind of surprise would take place. It took a good two minutes before the door was opened. Bobby waited around the corner until he heard the cart clanking into the room. He stepped out and getting behind the cart, he gave it a solid shove into the room. The look on Grant's face was priceless as he fell back into the room on his skinny ass. The look on Bobby's face was indescribable. 
Grant was dressed in full geisha outfit, complete with white pancake makeup and an obi belt tied in the back. Grant was looking like he was going to go to anaphylactic shock. Bobby stepped into the room and pushed the cart further forward so the door could close behind him. Hi, Grant. How you doing? Bobby looked around the room to see who Grant had for company. He was not prepared for the most voluptuous. And when she stood up, a very well-endowed she-male dressed as a French maid sitting on the bed. What are you doing here, Grant stammered. I'm going to call security and have you arrested. Here, go ahead and call. Bobby got up and walked toward the phone. Let's get the embassy involved. I'm sure they would find all this very interesting. Watching a person is puffed up with his own self-importance, slowly deflating into a shuddering pile of nerves, was both funny and sad. Kind of like watching a ship sink. You had to watch until it was out of sight. Grant was trying hard to inflate himself to his previous level of self-importance, but it just wasn't working well in the geisha outfit. He started to speak, and he just could not find the words. His mouth moved, but nothing came out except unintelligible sounds. He was so frustrated that he started to cry. Grant, or should I call you Smith? Why don't you sit down and drink the champagne I sent up while it's still cold? Come on, relax, Bobby said as he patted the man on his thin shoulders. Since he couldn't call for security, Grant had no choice but to sit and accept the long-stemmed glass flute of champagne offered. Since we will be working together, I thought we should get better acquainted. I feel like we got off on the wrong foot, and I want to try and rectify that, Bobby explained. Grant could not speak. It was all he could do to not lose control of his bladder or bowel, both of which were being tested beyond any previous limits. All he could do was nod and keep looking to the bed where the shemale was relaxing and watching the two men talk. He felt like he was in some kind of surrealistic movie without plot or credits. This couldn't be happening to him. The crystal meth he had snorted was now making him sick to his stomach. He wanted to throw up, but at the same time, the gastrointestinal problems at the other end of his thin body were hard to ignore. A long 15 seconds passed before Grant's biological needs took over. He bolted to the toilet where the sounds of his throwing up could be heard. A few minutes later, a visibly shaken and ashen-faced man came out. Okay. What do you want, O'Shaughnessy? Grant asked. Nothing more than your goodwill, Grant. You notice that I didn't bring a camera to try and gather evidence to embarrass you with. I don't want to continue this pissing contest you started. I'm just doing my job, Grant whined. Yeah, and you were enjoying that way too much, Bobby chuckled. Since we are on the same team, we are on the same team, aren't we? Grant could only nod. He was trying to resist the urge to run to the toilet again. I think it would be better if we worked together, don't you? Bobby asked. Another nod was the best the deflated and no longer pompous man could do. Among other things, I'm here to help the Wilsons, both in some official and unofficial capacities. For you to be breaking my balls when I need your help is not how teammates work together. As far as being difficult, well... We can chalk that up to a personality clash that has now been rectified, can't we? Bobby smiled a triumphant smile. A short, positive nod was all Grant could do without the urge to throw up some more. See, I knew that if we could just talk this out, everything would be fine. I really don't want anything else in particular. I just want you to stop breaking everyone's balls and making everything so difficult by being such a bitch. I'm sure you have enough problems of your own to worry about. As he was talking, Bobby glanced at the board to indifferent shemale on the bed, doing her nails and drinking champagne. Grant, too, was looking at his companion and getting distracted. I see you have some guilty pleasures, Bobby observed dryly as he looked at a dark lump of what appeared to be hashish on the coffee table. Well, I can't fault a man for things I myself have enjoyed in the past. I'm not sure what this is. Bobby said, poking at the pile of white powder on the table. This doesn't look like anything recreational, Bobby said with his face screwed up like he had smelled something nasty. I'm sorry that I had to intrude on your evening, Walter. Please accept my apology and I will see you at work. With that, Bobby got up and left. 
It took a good half hour for Walter to compose himself enough to join his companion and try and pick up where he left off. At the embassy the next day, Bobby called Sharon and told her, Why don't you ask Grant about the chauffeur's quarters again? Why, do you think he changed his mind? Oh, I don't know. Maybe he had a change of heart, Bobby chuckled as he hung up. Minutes later, Sharon had a much more amicable Mr. Grant on the phone. After a few pleasantries, the subject of the chauffeur's quarters came up again, this time with an entirely different attitude. Yes, I think that could be possible, Grant said. Of course, it will be up to Mr. O'Shaughnessy to make it livable. I don't see that as a problem, Mr. Grant.